Everything. Oh, very good. Uh, welcome um, to this uh, special colloquium. Today we have the pleasure to have Shmuel Bialy. Uh, uh, I've known him for several years already from several conferences and so on. Uh, when I first met him, I don't remember if you were still a grad student or already a postdoc, but something like that. And he has, of course, an interest in, in the interstellar medium, as his top title suggests. He got his PhD at Tel Aviv University and then did two postdocs in the US, one at the CFA and in Harvard and another one at the University of Maryland. And uh, so he has been working uh, with a variety of things, uh, mostly related to computing, but sometimes doing simulations, sometimes processing observations. And today he is going to talk to us about precisely that to, uh, with various groups in the US and, and in Europe uh, on how, st how stars shape the interstellar gas. Shmuel, well, thank you. Thank you, Enrique, for this nice introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, it's really a pleasure to be in Mexico, as I told Enrique and some others here. Yeah, I really love uh, visiting Mexico. It's not my first time. It's my first time in Morelia, but not first time in Mexico. Again, the practico mi español un poquito. But this time I'll start in English if you allow me. Um, yeah, so uh, my general interest through the last few years has been how stars shape the interstellar medium through different processes. I'll we'll talk about supernova, cosmic rays, and maybe if there's time, we'll also touch on UV radiation. That's different directions. Um, that's been with people from uh, Harvard, Vienna, MPA, and Florence on different sub projects that I'll discuss in this talk. Um, so let me just begin with um, trying to fix this. Yeah, that'll be useful. There's no good talk with no so technical difficulty in the beginning. Okay. Uh, maybe I have to go and show and then try again. Okay, no, it's okay. So first time, first thing that we see when we go outside at night. Is, is the stars. So this is the um, famous uh, picture by Van Gogh, Starry Night. And uh, that's how it looks like. Or maybe if you use some chemicals, it looks like this. <laughs> um, but except from the stars, there's much other things going on in between the stars, and that's the interstellar medium. So this image of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, <laughs> from uh, the Gaia satellite, where well, we can easily see all these brown gray uh, lanes and that's actually dusty clouds that goes happen to be in between the stars and that's where the action is happening that's where these clouds collapse to form new stars that then shape these clouds and that's the big topic of uh, this talk and as well as other topics in the ism and star formation so more concretely there is this important cycle that is happening in the interstellar medium uh, that the gas goes through, uh, where if, for example, we start from uh, the more diffuse, uh, less dense gas that is in, in the stars, the atomic interstellar medium. Oh, mm -hmm. there's some problem with the connection. I hope it won't happen again. Sorry about that. So the diffuse interstellar medium can come in different uh, colors and flavors. Uh, uh, most prominently, the cold and warm inter uh, neutral atomic medium, the CNM, WNM, we'll talk about it more later. Um, the CNM, the cold neutral medium, is 100 Kelvin, as typical density of 100 uh, or a few tens particles per cubic centimeter, and the warm neutral medium, 10 to the 4 Kelvin, and density of less than one particle per cc. Uh, the cold and denser gas in the atomic ISM here uh, can, due to gravity, collapse and become denser and colder and become molecular, and that's the famous molecular clouds, that then continue to collapse, form new stars. And once the stars are forming, they start to eject energy in different forms. 
Specifically, uh, radiation from the stars can destroy molecular clouds. And then there are winds from the uh, massive stars. And also, is there something we can do about Yeah, this? I think it's your computer who's trying to suspend after 30 seconds or a minute. The what? I think it's your computer yeah. trying to suspend after some time that you don't Oh, my computer? Yeah. No, it's never suspends. Maybe it's the connection. Maybe I can switch to a different USB. If you want. I'll do that. Yeah, but there's sometimes Is problem. That a Mac? Yes. It's a Mac, yeah. We had the same problem two weeks ago. Oh, really? With somebody else. Mm -hmm. I do know that sometimes one of these USB-C is not the best connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. OK, let's hope it won't happen again. OK, so the stars, once they born, they start to emit energy in different forms, and that's what we generally call feedback. So we, we said the radiation winds, and then the massive stars also, of course, can explode a supernova. And these supernova winds and radiation shape the interstellar gas yeah. in different forms. And so first of all, um, the... Uh, can you uh, share it in your screen, please? Because when you discover... Oh, it's not shared now? <laughs> uh-huh. Sorry about that, people on the Zoom. Is it now shared? Yes, it is. Yes. No, we have this. <laughs> I don't have. <laughs> we all did the same. <laughs> okay, let's see if we do that. And then we do it from here. And There it is. Oh, it's still there. Okay. <laughs> Just minimize that. Or, or, but yeah. Or move it. Yeah. Can you move that or minimize it? Uh, it's not on my computer. <laughs> yeah, it's on. I don't see it on Just my block. computer. Click on swap displays. What? What? Yeah. Maybe it was that you, you share the whole screen instead of just the, the, the PowerPoint. Oh, I should share just this. Just the PowerPoint, I guess. OK, so I stop share. Then I share PowerPoint. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Oh, <laughs> just close no. it. There's three there, buttons. In the, on the top, on the top yeah. there is a swap displays button. Uh, oh, swap displays? Now you see this. <laughs> On the summit looks fine now. Yes. Just play play from start. Let's see, let's see how play from start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but here it's, you see it's now you have to go again to swap the space. And now where is it? <laughs> <laughs> Did you learn more? Is to swap this question. Before it was showing. Before, when I started the play, it showed there was like a bottle that says smell this place. Oh, there it is on the top. Swap this. Yeah. The third. If we can reach it there. Oh. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. No. Oh, wait, but maybe. Yeah. Minimize. Minimize. No. Close it. Yeah. 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 There is the swap display. There's a main display and a and a yeah, okay. Are you good? Do you see do you see it well on the zoom or not? No, we, you're not sharing on Zoom. Ah, you're not sharing. Interesting. Now we only have 
<laughs> no, we're good. It's a nice way. <laughs> okay, let's kill this one. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So this one. Do they see it? Because if they see you can just move up. There you go. Yeah. Do they see it? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Chris McKee and Jerry Ostreicher from 77, where they introduced the idea of a three-phase interstellar medium and how supernova is producing a hot phase in the ISM. So we already talked a little bit about two phases, the cold and warm neutral medium in the cycle, if you remember when we talked about the atomic uh, phase of the interstellar medium, uh, these are neutral phases. But uh, if you think about it, when you have a supernova that explodes, of course, there's a lot of energy and it evacuates gas from a region and produces hot ionized material at about a million or more degrees in the region close to the supernova. And in this paper, they examine the situation where you have many supernova going on in the galaxy as a whole. So here in this diagram to the right, where you can see these bubbles, expanding bubbles from supernova or even clustered supernova expanding into the ISM. And in the interior, there's gas of 10 to the 6 Kelvin or so. And as these, as these bubbles expand, they engulf clouds of neutral uh, medium and molecular clouds. These are the circles to the left. And the clouds now find themselves in a hostile environment of hot gas, and they start to evaporate. And basically, the supernova destroys molecular clouds and the size of star formation, so it limits or inhibits further star formation. This is a form of negative feedback, right? You form stars and then these stars prevent the formation of the next star. And this is very intuitive, you know, intuitively thinking. If you think about supernova, that's what you think. If there is explosion and what explosion does, it destroys stuff, right? You explode, there's a lot of energy and everything that comes in the way will be destroyed. That's the negative form of supernova. Um, and uh, this uh, picture of a three-phase ISM with these hot bubbles and uh, expanding bubbles made by supernova is also confirmed in more recent numerical simulations. That's one example from the a group from a Max Planck, the so Silk. Uh, I just run the movie just to get the impression. What we're seeing is the, the, a slice of the galaxy from the side. It's a box. Uh, let's see if it runs. It's running now. Oh, it's running, yeah. So we're looking at the galaxy slides from the side. Uh, this is a hydro simulation with supernova and chemistry and magnetic fields, cooling and heating processes. To the left here, we see the slice of the density and then the temperature and other things like more, uh, atoms and molecules that are computed in the simulation. And as you can see, uh, supernovas start going off after a while and start to push gas away. And here we see, for example, this multi-phase ISM that you get because of the supernova interacting with the gas, as well as cooling and heating processes that are happening. So the temperature here goes from, um, what is the temperature scale? Oh, well, never mind. Oh, right here, here, below, yeah, from 10 to the 7. To 10 Kelvin, 10 to the 7 in red and 10 Kelvin in blue. So once the supernova explodes, you get very hot gas, but then some regions condense and start cooling and becomes colder down to 10 Kelvin in the molecular clouds. That's the three phase ISM, or if you like, a, um, continuous phase ISM. It's not already not so distinct the phases as they used to be in the classic uh, literature. However, um, the interesting thing is that supernova can also uh, give you a positive feedback, right? So we talked about how they destroy clouds, which is very natural, but they can also help to form clouds and to promote collapse and star formation. So if you think about it, for example, uh, what I show here is the uh, famous phase diagram for the neutral atomic interstellar medium showing the thermal pressure and density of the gas. And what we see here is that if you consider all the heating and cooling processes in the ISM, so heating is mainly from the UV radiation from stars and cooling is by different uh, uh, coolant agents, generally it's collisional excitation and emission of radiation. It would be Lyman alpha cooling, C plus O1 cooling, but generally the process is you have two particles colliding, exciting some energy level, 
and then the photon escapes the system. So if you consider all the cooling and heating processes and kind of ask, okay, now I have equilibrium steady state between cooling and heating, uh, what would be the temperature of the interstellar medium? So the answer is depending on the density of the ice, and we have a region with some density, you get different temperatures. So if the density is high, say 100 or 1,000 particles per cc, you see there is this phase. Here we look at the pressure, but the diagonal lines show the temperature. So and the temperature is generally 100 Kelvin. This corresponds, this is like a thermostat. You see the lines are parallel to this 100 Kelvin line because generally you have the cooling by C plus and O1 and the energy separation of these coolants is about the energy corresponds to about 100 Kelvin. So generally, whatever the heating rate is, you always get a flow of about 100 Kelvin here. If the density is too low, then the heating becomes more efficient and the gas uh, becomes uh, about 10 to the 4 Kelvin. These two, these two temperatures, 100 and 10 to the 4 Kelvin is very robust and very, the system often tends to these two temperatures. These are cold and warm neutral medium, CN and W and M. This has to do with the microphysics of these cooling mechanisms. Slime and alpha here, and metal line, fine structure, glow and C plus and O1 here. And then here in between, in these densities, there is the so-called thermal instability. If you have gas in this phase, it either heats up, it's either cooled down to the cold neutral medium or heats up to the warm neutral medium. Um, so generally, you get a separation of these two phases. Now, going back to the diagram we had before, starting from a diffuse and then a diffuse and warm gas. So if you imagine you had hypothetically IS, an interstellar medium of warm and diffuse gas and this warm neutral medium, and you want to get to the cold neutral medium, this is where you form star at high densities and low temperatures. You need to somehow reach from this part of the diagram to this part. So you have to cool down and condense. But this is a, this phase is, is a stable phase. So if you have gas and this warm neutral medium, it's a, in equilibrium between heating and cooling. And there is nothing for, no reason for the gas to just cool down. It's, it's, it can sit here forever. If you have no perturbation, you put a gas at, say, one particle or a 0 0.5, 0 0.5 particles per cc and this temperature of 10 to the 4, it will stay there. No, nothing will make it uh, cool down because you have balance between heating from the star, from the UV radiation, and cooling by lemon oil. So if you want to form stars in this denser phase, you need some, something to bring it there. And this you can get uh, generally by a shock of any kind. It could be in a supernova remnant that is expanding into the ISM or in spiral arms or in gas infalling onto the a galaxy. The general idea is that you need a shock with compression. So what happens if you have a gas here and it is shock heat, it, it gets a sh it, it, and it finds itself in a shock. So for example, you have a supernova that expands into the ISM. Now you had a shock at the front of the supernova remnant. What happens? The gas heats up adiabatically, so it becomes warmer and slightly denser by a factor of four typically. Now here it is above the steady state diagram. In this region, cooling is more efficient than heating. And so you're not in steady state anymore. And you start to cool, typically isobarically at first, because you are still in the shock region, so you feel the same pressure. So you start to cool at the same pressure, so it's isobarically, until you reach a, steady, a new steady state, and that's the cold neutral heat. So this is a general process that is found in any kind of shock, as I said. But, uh, yes. but that happens to the compressed because yes, they yes. heat up this very low density. Right? Yes, not, not everywhere. So not the supernova itself. Well, not so the, the supernova, the supernova the, 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 you had the energy that pushes gas outwards, and this gas feels a shock. But the general ISM, let's say you were in a warm neutral medium outside the supernova, suddenly you feel the shock. And then first you heat up, you become, say, 10 to the 6 or something. So you, that's why you see these diagonal lines. So you, you're now not at 10 to the 4. You were 10 to the 4. Now you become 10 to the 6. You also compress a little bit. You have the shock. 
Yeah, but that process happens to the compressed. Yeah, so now the, yeah, yeah, the region the around the supernova, this yeah. shell will be, after a while, it will be compressed and become cold. And that actually happens, the cooling time is typically about a one to 10 mega years. So it's not in the beginning of the supernova. After the supernova is already several 10 kilometers per second, so it's already no, very, not very fast. And then the entire shell, it's called shell, shell condensation, becomes a cold and dense. And in the shell of the supernova, now you can imagine that there are like regions, if you had turbulence, it's not, not already not uniform. So there are regions that are more clumpy and these regions can then become the new molecular clouds. So this is downstream of the shell? Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Higher pressure because of internal energy. Yeah. Okay. So it goes like this. And then it can also, you know, after a while, it will go down to normal pressure of the ice, but it's still now will be in this cold neutral medium. Yeah, branch rather than the warm branch. So it doesn't have to remain at high pressure. It can go back to normal pressures after a while, but it'll still be cold. But then if you have gravity, you can collect it, and then it will increase in pressure. But the density jump is, if it's, it's a usually a strong shock, there's four times yes. the density it encounters. Yes. So let's say you're at a, uh, over the unity density, you just get four times as much. Yeah, so that, that's, that's the importance of this thermal instability strip, because if it was just, if it was either thermal gas, you just get a factor of four, not, not a big deal. Yeah. But because they have this thermal instability, you can, the density in, um, the difference here between these two phases is a factor of 100. Yeah. But the problem here, you're stable, there's no reason for you to, to get there, but this per perturbation is basically serves as a perturbation to bring you from the warm to cold usually. So now this, Factor of four becomes a factor of 100. Well, you go back here and now you were here at point three, now you become third. So basically the supernova and the shock is just a way for, to shake the system and take you from one stable state, the warm neutral medium to another stable state, the cold neutral medium. And then you need gravity to further increase this region, but at least now you're in the ballpark. So that's the idea of how supernova can uh, act as a catalog catalyst to promote uh, cloud condensation and then star formation. And this has been shown analytically by Ryuma and Onatsuka from 2010 and other papers with uh, simulations as well. Of course, it's not the only re reason and the question how effective it is is a valid question, but uh, it's a, an, a way. And it's probably might be a very effective way because supernova are happening all the time everywhere. And in terms of simulations, this is also seen in the simulation. This is again from this, this from Silk, uh, Silk Zoom, zooming in onto a region of this ISM, and then supernova exploding here. This is a view from top down, uh, face on. And then these regions that around the supernova, here was a cluster uh, of uh, massive stars and supernova exploding. And then in this region around, you have the shell formation and condensation due to this process that they just described. So they find it also in simulation that uh, cloud uh, condensation is uh, um, helped, catalyzed by a supernova. So that's the general idea from the theoretical point of view. Now, uh, in this work that I want to describe, we, we actually looked into observations. So we asked ourselves, can you see that in observations? And the first answer is no, because it's very difficult to see this because as we said, the time scale for this cooling is about 10 mega years. That's just like the time scale it takes on the point of view of microphysics. And at this point, the supernova remnants, they're no longer your classic small energetic, you know, expanding supernova and meeting in X-rays from the center. It's already at the point where it's almost stopped expanding and almost uh, the gas is almost uh, um, connects back with the general ISM around it. So in observations, it's very difficult to see because in observations, we usually have access only to two dimensions. So not only the supernova not expand very fast and are not glowing in X-rays, but also you have a lot of confusion along the line of sight. And as an example, let's have a look at this region in, the, in our galaxy, the two clouds, the famous star forming regions, Taurus and Perseus. Um, in red and blue here. And for example, you can see that 
on the sky, this is a map of Planck, uh, dust uh, from Planck. They seem to be touching each other, these two clouds, Perseus and Taurus. But do they? So this is a little bit like this image here where you see this huge person and the small people and he is like stepping on them. Actually, we don't have, this is in the Salar Desert in Bolivia where the terrain is such that it's hard to say where the person is standing near us or at the distance of these people. And because the terrain is such, we can't have a good estimate for the distance. And therefore it looks as if the person is giant. This is the problem with most observation in astrophysics. We don't have a good estimate for the distance. So we don't know, for example, if uh, Taurus here is indeed bigger than Perseus or is it just closer? And is it really touching or is it just in the foreground and Perseus is in the back? That's a general problem we have. And there's different ways to uh, make this better. Recently, indeed, there was a big development. Uh, I mean, in the last few years or even 10 years, in the development of a technique called 3D dust mapping. And the idea is that you have an estimate of the column density, how much dust, or if you like, if you have a dust to gas ratio of gas, you have between you and stars through the extinction of their starlight. If you have more extinction of the starlight, you know there's more dust. So you, you, you know what's the column density towards stars from, star, from stellar extinction. And now with Gaia, there's been a lot of progress in knowing the exact location of stars in parallax. So now you know not only the column density, you also know the distance. If you have many stars, imagine you have two stars, you know the column density to that star, the next you know the delta and the column density between these two stars. Now you know exactly what's the distance between these two stars. So you divide the two and you get the mean density between these two stars. And people have been working with this idea and developing it more with more rigorous um, a computer algorithm to make a very accurate, a very high resolution, a three-dimensional map of the density of the ISM around us. So it's like a simulation cube with 700 or so cells in 3D, where in each cell we know now exactly what is the density, the 3D density of the ISM. So now instead of looking in two dimensions, we can actually look at this three-dimensional map, but now it's not a simulation, it's an observation. We did this um, with this uh, new uh, 3D dust map of uh, Leica et al. from 2020. These two clouds is again Perseus and Taurus, Perseus in red and Taurus in blue, but now we'll just be looking in 3D how it looks like from this 3D dust map. So first we see that there are different locations that are not connected. One is 300 parsecs and one 150. This is low density gas at five particles per cc. Now, as we scroll through, we can see the structure of this 3D density gas, and we see that it actually kind of connects these two clouds in a, a geometry that is like a shell. This is at uh, 5 and 25 uh, particles per cc density, what we see here. But actually, we can see, look at all densities and analyze it more uh, carefully. And that's what we did. So this is, again, uh, this 3D uh, dust map. This is the sun. Uh, at the left, we see the sun. We see Perseus and Taurus from different angles. And the circle is not part of the observation. <laughs> it's the a model that we fit to this uh, geometry of the dust. This is three cuts through the uh, uh, 3D dust map. X, Y, uh, X, Z, and Y, uh, Z. Well, we can see that indeed you, you get a very non-homogeneous, not, not very ordered, but you have a shell with a mean, dia mean diameter of 150 parsec, range is 75, uh, centered at about 200 parsecs away from us in between Perseus and Taurus. At the right, you see density profiles. So for example, the top right, you see the gray is the mean density at each radius, so each radius the different density, then you just look what's the mean and plot it as a function of radius. The guess is very non homogeneous. Right? Every point, you'll find very different densities. It's not one density. You'll find densities going from 30 to 1, but uh, that's why you see all these lines here. And this is indeed expected in the interstellar medium, this turbulent and multi phase. 
But generally, there is a trend that as you go towards the center, you have more and more low density gas. So, for example, this purple line here is a gas that is above one particle per cc, then three, 10, and 30. And you see in the center, you don't have any gas of like above three or 10, or even little gases dense as one particle per cc. However, as you go towards the radius of the shell, there is more of this dense gas. Here at the lower part, it's the mass fraction of these different densities. So for example, there is more than 50% gas of density above three, and a significant fraction of gas that is 10 particles per cc or so at the radius of the shell. That would be the density of the CNN. And as you go to the center outwards, there is more WNM or even less dense gas. So that's the morphology of this shell. This has not been detected, uh, uh, known before. This, uh, we were able to discover this shell because of this new ability of these 3D dust maps that were not present before this high resolution. What is the size of the bubble? The bubble is uh, 75 parsecs in radius. In radius. Yeah, 115 diameter. So it's uh, the distance between Perseus and Taurus exactly. Can right. you show the the, the image where you have the, the what? The, oh, the, the, the blue and red uh, clouds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll in a moment I'll have a okay. you know, interactive where I'll just mm -hmm. play around. Yeah. And now, so okay, so what's the source of this bubble? So first of all, it's just um, you know just considering its size. And the, the theoretical works on the feedback of, from winds or, so there's different things that produce bubbles like this. H2 regions are bubbles, winds produce bubbles, supernova produce bubbles. But if you consider theoretical works on these different types of feedback, usually H2 regions are much smaller, so are the bubbles produced by winds. It's very difficult to produce such a big bubble by any of these processes. Even supernova is not energetic enough, as I'll show in a second, you'll probably need a few. One is not enough. So the main, uh, uh, the leading idea is that it's probably produced by several supernova that occurred one after the other. Um, we looked in different other data. Uh, I will not show all of them in the paper we have. H alpha, aluminum 26 that is produced by supernova also. H1, CO, different tracers. This is x-rays from Erosita. Um, Erosita is not public, especially not this part. This part, uh, the Russians and Americans, uh, they split the sky <laughs> like they split the world. <laughs> they now split the sky between Russia and America. And uh, this part is the Russian part. The Germans Italian. and Russians. Oh, yeah, German, Germans, oh, sorry. Germans. That's right, Germans <laughs> and Russians. Yeah, America was Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Germans and Russians. So yeah, so they, in the Russian part, where the Russian scientists, some of them sit in Germany, but, <laughs> but they didn't give us the data, even though we asked. But we were able to hack it a little bit. So we played the game of um, a PowerPoint or a keynote. So we put this, this was publicly released, the image here, yeah, it's on the internet. So you can put it on PowerPoint and then you can and you know what's the projection, so you can put the coordinates, and we know what is the coordinates of the Peritau shell. We know the X, actually, we know X, Y, Z of every point there, right? It's a 3D dust map. So we can project the, uh, the outer edge of the uh, Peritau shell on the Eurozeta data in PowerPoint. That's what we did. And this is the green circle. This is a projection of the Peritau shell on Eurozeta. And if we zoom in, uh, here we can see that there is in the, inside the red circle some uh, 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 emission of uh, diffuse um, soft X-ray emission. But once we get the data, we'll you know go into it deeper. But this might be uh, produced by hot gas produced by a recent supernova within the last mega year or so. So if you had a supernova that occurred, it will produce hot gas and X-ray emission. Um, other tracers, it's there's some aluminum 26, but it's also very hard to say because aluminum 26 is all over the place. Aluminum 26 is produced by super. So currently, we don't have uh, definite proof that was that this was produced by supernova, 
Um, but we do have this cavity that we think produced by supernova, and we can estimate from the velocities of Perseus and Taurus outwards, uh, we can estimate the age of this shell to be between five and 22 mega years. And uh, based on the momentum that is required to produce uh, this shell, so we know the mass and the velocity, we can, and using simulations of supernova that explode inside non-homogeneous ISM, we can uh, predict that you need about two to eight supernova to give this momentum that we see to produce this shell. We can also, if we know the number of supernova, we can go back and say for normal IMF, how many, if there was a cluster of stars where the supernova went off in the center, what would be the mass of this cluster? And that would be about 1,000 solar masses. There is no cluster now in the center of the Peridot shell. And something that we want to do in the future, and it requires more work, is after 10 mega years, you don't, no longer expect a cluster to continue and be at the same place because these kind of clusters are dispersed after this time scale. So you have a lot of stars in the region of this big volume of 150 parsecs in diameter. And the idea is to take these stars and their velocities and see if going back in time, if they produce a cluster of this kind in the center. And if they do, that would be um, a smoking gun for this uh, theory. This hasn't been done before. Yeah, yes, so I just wanted to make the connection to a larger environment. And also, this is the what you wanted to see in 3D. So there, in the paper, we, we made like interactive figures. And there's also something cool, this AR, augmented reality, where you can actually project this on the table. And I'll show you a video in a second. Let's see. If Okay, you know what? I'll just show the video instead of doing this. Um, let me see. Uh, okay, let me summarize and then I'll show the video. Let me summarize this part. So what we've seen in this part of the talk, and I'll, after that I'll talk a little bit about cosmic rays and then I'll finish, is that supernova uh, can obviously destroy clouds, but they can also promote cloud condensation and star formation, and Pertau is might be an example for this process of positive supernova feedback. And then in general, from a point of view of observations, this new technique of 3D dust maps uh, shows us new structures that could not be seen in two dimensions. Now, because we talk about three, 3D, uh, we, this being done as part of uh, this group of Alyssa Goodman at CFA, and Alyssa is also a big fan of uh, data visualization in three dimensions, so we connected with a company, Delightex in Germany, who does AR, augmented reality. Basically the idea is that you can, and this was the first paper where you had augmented reality um, integrated into an astronomy paper. So we have this figure, now it looks different. Never mind. you have a figure in the paper, you can scan the QR code with your phone, and then you, it opens an app on your phone, and then uh, through the phone, you can see the Peritau shell, projected on the table. And then you can kind of, with your, you still need to hold your phone. Maybe you can put it in the, you know, the uh, cars or what. You put it here and you just walk around and you see uh, the Peritau shell and you can like look at it as if it's on the table. Let me show you the video. So this is a video I took at the Forge Cafe in Somerville in Massachusetts when I had my coffee morning uh, during the pandemic was bored. I took this video with my phone. Sorry, I think we lost the audio on Zoom.
Hi, um, I think the speaker has muted themselves on Zoom, so we can't hear anything. So that little, it's small, yeah, because this entire thing is almost 800 parsecs in size, and prayer tower is 150 in diameter. I see. So, so no. that, um, there's a window on our uh, speaker <laughs> computer that the host would like to unmute, but we cannot click it. Yeah, we can. thank you. Sorry, I, I was, yeah, thank you. You cancel that? <laughs> uh, I can't. You can, uh, can you just say okay or whatever? We can actually not click on it. Huh. I I don't know what to do here. Oh, oh, let's see. No, it looks like I can't really do anything here. Can I ask a question in the middle? Yes, yes. So in the, in, in the theoretical model that you have, how fast is the expansion uh, at, in Paris and Versus from the center of the world? Yeah, so now it's very slow. Now it's already about 10 kilometers per second. So it's already at the phase of dissemination back with the and, ISM. But that's the, the that's the velocity of the dense gas, not of the not of the supernova. That's right, yeah. Well it's it's slow, it, it should be detectable. I mean 10 kilometers if, if I mean we, we, at this point it's already very difficult because when it reaches uh, 10 kilometers per second, which is also the velocity dispersion in the ISM, you start to be affected by just turbulent motions in the ISM. And then, uh, so in fact, what we see if we look at Perseus and Taurus, for example, Perseus has a big velocity gradient going from zero to 10. Uh, so different parts of it expand at different velocities and Taurus expands at, it has a velocity of about four to six it's all relative to us. So there is no real expansion from one another. Um, and on the other hand, you know, at this point when the supernova remnant reaches that slow velocity, you, and you start being affected by these general motions in the ISM, it's already very chaotic. It's not just the expansion. So for example, what I wanted to show in the large uh, scale picture, uh, where was it? Here. This is what we saw the um, Sun, the Taurus, the Perseus. And in the larger context, we are sitting here. This is Perseus, this is Taurus. This is moving away from us at about six. This is moving away from us at one to 10. So there's a gradient. And now, uh, actually, in another work with uh, Catherine Zucker and also people from the Goodman Group. Uh, published in Nature this year, or last, the end of last year, um, we talked about the local bubble. The local bubble is also expanding. And we find a similar picture that the, the clusters on the local bubble are expanding outwards. And if we could trace back in time, we find that they all were in the central region here in the center about 20 million years ago. We think that um, this expansion and condensation resulted in the formation of new clouds. And in, in particular, Taurus may have been produced by this expansion of the local bubble and the peritop shell, which kind of collided. And in the center, you have peritop. So, this is to say that you cannot, you not necessarily you can ignore the larger environment when you try to understand what are the velocities of these things. So for example, maybe if you didn't have the local bubble here, Taurus would be expanding outwards as you would expect. But because of the collision with the local bubble, it's now instead experiencing this pressure out, uh, outwards of the sun. It is now expanding to the wrong direction than you expect. So they were independent in that extent, the, the, per, the pertile. Uh, yes, we think independent. We think there was a star cluster here that push the gas outwards. And then you had star clusters here when we, in fact, the clusters of stars moving now outwards. 20 years ago, they were all in this position here. So it all kind of um, consistent with the idea that there were like two independent 
super mega supernova M, and it's not a supernova M because there's a it's a cluster of several supernovae that push the gas outwards. But there was like Can I ask a question, please? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry, uh, and we'll say it's beautiful um, work. This I wanted to ask about another um, region that's very close to there, which is the Orion uh, Eridanus super bubble. I'm wondering if you might comment on if there's any possible link to, to that region. Yes, um, so, uh, so, so you mean in, in Orion? Yeah, I guess uh, that has, there's a whole, there's a super bubble that envelops the whole of Orion and Eridanus. Yes, that includes yes. um, Barnard's loop, and then there's there's, there's further out uh, shells. Yes, on the scale of a actually, actually, that's another paper. That's another paper we just published with uh, uh, with Mike Foley, the first author, where we studied specifically the Orion. And okay. so we think this is. I mean, it seems to us that it's all kind of the same process that is happening. It's just every time. Different location here. There was also in the region of Orion. The different star cluster. Probably don't see your hand. In oh, the, sorry. In Orion, there was a different star cluster that again produced supernova and then uh, produced this mm -hmm. shell that is seen there. And the expansion is towards a different direction. And then sometimes you have collision between shells. Not in, maybe not in the case of Orion and Per Tau, although they're close. Mm -hmm. And other cases you have also a collision of shell. Depends on where you know when you look at the. Uh, you know, maybe if we wait enough, and also we see it. It's Orion. just the, what, what, what you have there is sort of the inner part of the Orion Eridana super bubble. But as yeah. I understand it, it's actually somewhat about two or three times larger than that, which would sort of make it look like it overlapped with your regions, at least. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to see the, there in 2D, but I encourage everyone who is interested in the paper we have in these two papers that are now on the screen, the Ali et al. 2021. I have links to interactive figures where you actually can play with this in 3D and see uh, how it looks in 3D. Because before you do that in 3D, it's difficult to actually see where do they touch, where it's just a projection and it looks as if they might be touching. Mm -hmm. okay, but yeah, thank you. this, for example, big figure, you can do that and see the orientation. Um, all right, so that was my, my that, that was my summary about the supernova, and I guess I ran out of time. So maybe I will not talk about cosmic rays. I will just tell you what I wanted to say about cosmic rays, but I will not show you the slides. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we talked about uh, supernova and three D uh, dust observation and how they help um, to understand the structure of the ISM. The cosmic rays is a different project that is connected to supernova because supernova produce cosmic rays. Now, cosmic rays, they're important for different reasons, but if you think about molecular clouds and the phase before they collapse to form stars, cosmic rays are especially important there, specifically cosmic rays are below TV or GV, or so low energy cosmic rays, not these super energy cosmic rays that some people are interested in. But actually they're more abundant, they're very abundant, normal low energy cosmic rays. These cosmic rays penetrate and produce ionization in these clouds. And then these clouds are then coupled to the magnetic field of the galaxy. But also the ionization promotes chemistry because these clouds are cold. If not the cosmic rays, you cannot form any molecules in water. But these cosmic rays produce ionization and then you have a different kind of chemistry that relies on these ions and formation of different molecules and also heating the temperature of these clouds. And then the star formation that follows depends on these cosmic rays. Yet the abundance or the ionization rate of these cosmic rays is very poorly known to date. It's very difficult to observe them. They do not reach Earth because they're low energy. There are very indirect methods that people use to determine these cosmic rays. On this project, if you're interested, talk to me. I thought of a new idea, how can we determine or constrain these low energy cosmic rays? But this is by molecular hydrogen. So the idea of the cosmic rays, they don't only ionize, ionize molecular clouds, they also excite. They have molecule, sometimes it's ionized, sometimes it's excited. By excited, I mean it starts to vibrate and rotate, vibrational rotation, the energy levels of H2. And then these H2 emit photons, typically in the infrared, as the energy level that correspond to this vibration. 
And if we detect this emission, we can constrain what's the excitation rate or what's the cosmic rays that are inside these clouds. This has never been done before because this emission is very weak. There's not a lot of cosmic rays. However, uh, fortunately, it happened to be uh, within the um, uh, wavelengths of JWST or James Webb Space Telescope. So potentially, if they give me time, I'll be able to, uh, that was a, a proposal I just submitted a few months ago, we'll be able to look at this cloud, or as an example, Barlow 68, and detect this very weak emission that is produced by excitation of cosmic rays. And then this, if this works, that would be a new way to uh, constrain or to derive the ionization rate of these low energy cosmic rays, but as currently kind of very uncertain. And yeah, and with this, I'll finish the talk and take more questions. Thank you. Uh, before I take questions, I would like to mention th that we're taking Shmuel to, for lunch. So we'll meet here at 2 p.m. At the, the, at the door. If anybody wants to join, especially the students, uh, they're welcome. Uh, that's been the tradition when we hit back from when we had a live colloquia like today. So uh, we're trying to restart it and having him here, that's a good opportunity. So uh, having said that, and opening the invitation for the lunch, uh, yeah, we'll open up for questions. Did the students have a free lunch, you say? Or, yeah, the they, they, yeah, we pay for the students, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So going back to the last point that you made about cosmic rays, so don't you expect uh, these uh, dynamo molecular clouds to be also TEV bright uh, because you get so many of these accelerated photons interacting with the H2 regions or something? And, mm -hmm. and the other thing is, should they not be also emitting um, OH maser? Why OH maser? Because of these dense regions, they, this, many of these uh, molecular clouds are which uh, major sources? Okay. That was my, my understanding. I, I don't really work on these. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so there's different points. I, I went through that very quickly. But for example, what you said about TV. So there is, a, for, for example, gamma rays that are produced by different kinds of interaction of the high energy cosmic rays with the um, gas. It doesn't have to be molecular. I mean, it doesn't care. Okay. And that is observed. And that's another way of determining cosmic, specifically high energy cosmic rays. Here the idea is different. It's the idea of let's try and, um, and try and constrain the low energy cosmic rays. This is the uncertain part. The high energy cosmic rays, we know about them quite well already from just the AMS, the space station or Voyager. The low energy cosmic rays is the question. The low energy cosmic rays, they, they don't do that kind of inter hadronic interaction. They ionize or excite, they have low energies. And so that's the idea there is to really, what can we do? And people, what usually they've been doing is they measuring different mo other molecules, exotic molecules like ST plus, HCO plus, argonium H plus, different exotic molecules using a very uh, elaborated chemical models to say, given these abundances that we measure of these molecules and this astrochemical model we have, what should be the cosmic ionization rate, but they have very lots of uncertainties. Here, the idea is to use H2 directly because that's where all the mass is. Right. Yeah, it partly answers your question. Maybe there, yeah, there's also this OH maser, which I, I think they're related. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So one of the more, one of the beautiful James Webb images that came recently is one, it's got a shape over the main, where you see all these structuring. Yeah. yeah. Almost like I don't know. Like yeah, you, uh, actually, I need I need to add that to my yeah. slide. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's it's kind of, and and then I remember a very long time ago, Elias brings it maps of M thirty one in H one, and found also a lot of bubbles, hundreds. Yes. So this seems to be kind of a ubiquitous yes uh, property of the ISM, and and it's natural to think that you know there might be a, you know that the origin might be spelled that way. Mm -hmm. But that's a lot of supernovae as you need, right? <laughs> I mean, that galaxy in particular. And, and then, as, as you said, you can't really find, at least until now, the culprit at the center, right? I mean, so I understand there's 10 mega years of one by, so it, you know, the cluster has been. You know, mm -hmm. But it's, it's kind of, you know, I, I wonder if that's really uh, 
plausible that all of these bubbles, given how many there are, uh, are all created by this mechanism. Yeah. And, and, and then the other side of this is that if that's really what's happening, then there must be situations going on now where you have a previous state, right? Where you, 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 these supernovas are, are not so expanded, uh, are, are much more, the, the cluster is still there. Mm -hmm. So I think one a different way to approach this would be to look for these earlier stages, mm -hmm. right? Not, not, because once you are at that stage, as you said, the supernova have exploded, the cluster is undone, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, but but there must be if if there are, if that is really such a common occurrence, there must be earlier stages going on now. Yes, and looking, you know, looking for these would be. You know. No, I, I agree with everything you said. So, first part of your question, I think I didn't do the calculation myself, but from what we looked at, this for example, three regions that we looked so far in our galaxy, the Pear Tau, the local bubble in Orion, and we kind of made the estimate of. How many, on the one hand, we estimated how many supernova are needed to produce this cavity. On the other hand, you can ask yourself, is it realistic to have so many supernova in that time and that volume? Because we know more or less what's the density of supernova that is happening. And the answer is yes, the numbers do add up. So it makes sense for the pair tau to have between two and 12, two and 12 supernova in that volume within 10 mega years within the, you know, it agrees with our estimate of how many supernova, one per century, whatever, uh, um, that are happening. And so I think also in the example you said from JWST, if we go there, it, at least from the point of view of simulations, that's very much what you see in simulation. The supernova go off and they produce a morphology that is like in that galaxy. And it does make sense. There is a lot of supernova, just the time scale is very fast. And then the other part that you said, yeah, I think it's a very good way, probably uh, not in our galaxy because the stage of Earth, this early stage goes, in, you miss it very fast, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's two thousand years and then you're already out of the stage. And so most likely you will always see these big bubbles that, you know, because just of the time scale argument. But if you go to other galaxies, then you probably might be able to find that. People are trying to do that. We have Jane. Yeah. Hi, I'm sorry I missed the first three quarters of your talk. But <laughs> uh, going back to what Laurent was saying about the the, uh, the the bubbles, there was a conference that I think you organized way back in '98 about the oh, A1 perfect. structures. Is it in program? Something like that. Oh. And whether they were actually physical structures made by expansion and with cavities made by something in the middle, or whether they were sort of um, of coincidence in the line of sight. So I was wondering whether you've done any sort of velocity statistics on, on I assume there were simulations in that bit, um, sort of to, to see whether you get the same sort of statistics from the simulations that we get from observation. Mm. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't do that, but I, I can just, you know, use this opportunity to mention something that is very much related. I think one effort that uh, my collaborators uh, do, so Catherine Zucker and uh, um, Josh Peak at the Space Institute and some other people, is to try and connect. So in the 3D dust map, you only have, you have 3D, which is impressive, but you don't have velocity. On the other hand, in spectroscopic observation, you have 2D, but you also have velocity, but they, it's kind of difficult to connect it to. So in, in our case, we could connect some points. For example, Perseus and Taurus, you, very clearly seen the 3D dust maps, and you also very clearly see in CO, so you can connect and get velocities as well as 3D morphology. But in general, it's difficult, but some groups are trying to connect the 3D dust maps with a, a spectroscopic observation, or there are other ways to do dust, uh, map, 3D maps, not with dust, but for example, with dips or like other measurements that have velocity and then if you do that, you have 3D and velocity, and then you can try and answer this question. Currently, I think it's still in the preliminary stages of this. So um, I was also wondering about this, this bubble. Uh, in principle, the cluster that should give the rise of this bubble should have like four passes inside, no? I mean, uh, How much? velocity dispersion of- Thousand solar masses. Sorry? Thousand solar masses. Thousand solar masses in max. In mass. Yes, but but uh, I mean at a velocity dispersion of what two kilometers per second? No, more five even. Or... Okay, five. But then 
uh, how much it will be the time. You will reach the bubble okay. size. How did you compute the time, the, the dynamical time? Because well, it's just just like um, these kind of cluster typically have about five kilometers per second. Yes. And then uh, how we computed the dynamical, the dynamical time, time of the bubble, bubble of the yeah. shell. Yeah. Well, we, we got an, a, a limit, a two lim upper limit and lower limit. The upper limit it could not be more than 10, 10 mega years because um, now the shell is not expanding anymore. So let's say it's already the end of the shell. It's already reached the velocity dispersion or the sound speed of the warm mutual medium 10 or so kilometers per second. So now it's sitting there. How much time would it take for the ISM with its velocity dispersion or sound speed to fill up the shell so you won't see this anymore? And the answer is 10 mega years with the, kit, with the size of the shell and the known velocity dispersion of the gas. So it cannot be older than 10, than 10 million years. 10 million so years. then, then the, the, the clusters should have a maximum size of what? Of the size of about 80, of about the entire thing. Yeah, but still you should have, I mean, uh, because not all the, 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 the stars have that velocity, that's the velocity dispersion. So you still have, should have stars flying away from the center. Yes. And that should be the by Gaia. Yes. Okay. So I'm saying it's possible. We started doing that, but as you do that, you find it's not so easy because first of all, it's so many stars there and some of them have types and some of them not. And times age estimates are not clear also. And there is just a mess. There are so many stars going in all directions. And then also you can imagine that the shell and the stars do not ex go with the experience different, the shell experiences drop, right? So if it becomes large enough, it can fill the ISM around it and it will eventually start moving with the ISM. Where the stars, if they had some uh, velocity, the star cluster, if it had some velocity relative to the general ISM, after it explodes, these stars will continue moving and they are moving ballistically. They don't feel drag. So there can be also offset between the stars and the shell. So all this to say that it's possible, but you need to put more time into this, which I didn't do because of the cosmic. <laughs> and the other question that I have is, can you put the face on a view of your map, yeah. of your interactive map, if possible? Because uh, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, this actually, one? yeah. So what is the face on you? Let's see. Ah, I know. Uh, maybe is we can- the view from the sun. I can do this. Where's the zoom? Um, if I can share. Or maybe the one screen. I mean, the, 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 just the map. Oh, okay, just the map, because, yeah, I, because on, my map, on my screen, it's very fun. Mm -hmm. How can I- uh, I will download it in my cell phone. <laughs> No, but I want to share my entire screen. Uh, oh, here it is. Wait a second. So, so the, the point that I wanted to tell you is, um, so far I remember, Laurent has the, 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 the distances to Taurus in different places. Mm -hmm. And for, uh, if I recall properly, the, you have these filaments, and the right uh, part of the filament is 35 seconds closer to the other part. Oh, yeah, yeah. But in this map, my impression is yeah. that it's kind of the, in the... No, yeah, the right one, right one. You have the sun, and Taurus, and Taurus, and then... Well, I have even... Um... Oh. Where is the sun? The <laughs> sun is here. The other one. Which one? On the right. The right. Sun, and the sun is kind of like... You see yeah. the sun? See, see. Sun, and then uh -huh. Taurus is the red sun. Okay. Okay. So it's not in the edge of the bubbles. No, no. Because I thought it was kind of tangential to the bubbles. So they, there's actually something also interesting in Taurus that we couldn't explain. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, you know, if there's someone interested, we can look into that further. Also something new that was not discovered, but in 3D dust, you see that actually now when you go back to CO, you can see it also in CO. And that's that Taurus is, has this, uh, so if, if, the, if we're looking from the sun and towards Taurus and Perseus, it's Taurus is on the front of the bubble. It has these different arms and Perseus is there. But also we see that actually, if you look at the lower density gas, there is a big, a big a ring that was not discovered before. These arms are actually part, connect, 
at the end, and there is like a big ring yeah, that is sitting like... on the sh on the surface of the shell, the spring. Mm -hmm. And you now, once you know the spring, you can actually also see it in CO, but it's difficult to see it a priori if you didn't know about it. But when you plot the CO on top of the dust, you can see the spring, and it's not expanding. It has one. It's all all in one velocity channel in CO. And so we don't know, but there is like a hole and there's a ring and it's like all part of this torus, that which is sitting on the, on the edge of the shell. Okay. Yeah, we should go to the yeah. Zoom. Yeah. So questions in the Zoom? There are no questions right now. Uh, does anybody want to raise their hand for a question? Apparently not. We don't have any questions on Zoom. Thank you. Oh, this is the one. No, 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 no. Yeah. Can I well, well, I I wanted to make uh, one quick comment. This is short, and then we can discuss later. Yes. But in my mind, trying to look at the big picture, uh, I think one of the main drivers uh, that shapes the gas should be gravity, right? Mm -hmm. Because after all, in a galaxy like ours, most of the molecular gas is in the spiral. Mm -hmm. So that must be the main collector. And then um, in my picture, and then we can discuss this, whether you mm -hmm. would agree with this, supernovae are like the aftershocks of a massive earthquake. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, would there be any way of uh, addressing this? Because for example, just all of these regions that you're looking at, are they located mainly on spiral arms or how far from the spiral arms do, can you get? I mean, the, after all, there has to be a cloud before the first supernova yeah. comes on. So uh, no, I, I I agree with you. I think I think what might be, I mean, in my mind, what might be happening is like on larger scale, they have a big gravitational potential of the galaxy, which because of gravitational instabilities tend to form mm -hmm. spiral arms, mm -hmm. and and now you have most of the gas there, and then they collapse mm -hmm. and start forming stars and going supernova, and then instead of having nice spiral arms. You know, have hole full of holes, mm -hmm. and mostly this condensation of and colliding shells will be happening within the spiral arms because that's where most of the gases begin with. Mm -hmm. So that's all. Also, the next generation of star formation will still happen more or less within these spiral arms, albeit there is also you know the shear as these structures, you know, you know rotate around yeah. the center. But more or less, generally saying where most of the gas is, that's also where. So if the supernova happened in the spiral arm, in the re region outside the spiral arm or above and below this, gas will be expanding, but there's no much gas. So there might be some condensation, next generation of star formation, but that not be the main molecular, big molecular cloud and star formation. Other in the spiral arms, that's where you have most of the gas. And then it's just like this, the kind of the supernova creates holes within the spiral arms and condensations within the spiral and makes this all much more, much less, not um, homogeneous or nice. Uh -huh. I'm uh -huh. sure the discussions in your group will be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to finish here. <laughs> we thank the speaker. Uh -huh. uh, whoever uh, wants to go to the uh, lunch at 2 p.m. are welcome to come to join the entrance. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Motivating <laughs> Thank you.